Welcome back to the Lifelong Learning Executive Education Series. I am your host, Andy Storch, and I'm excited to be joined today by Professor Cheryl Waxlack, who is the Associate Professor of Management and Organization. Professor Waxlack, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. We got through the hardest part, which was pronouncing my name. So that, that's good. Now it's easy going from here. I was nervous about that. Um, and I want to jump right in. Uh, you are an expert in something called humanistic leadership. And I wonder if you could explain what is that and, and why is it relevant to uh, leaders out there in the corporate world? Yeah, so to me, humanistic leadership is very much about putting people at the center of leadership and, and not just not just saying we're doing that, but really doing that. So thinking about the dignity of people um, as people, not only in terms of what they can accomplish for us, not only in terms of what we can get out of them, but starting from recognizing their inherent dignity and then building a system of leadership that revolves around that. So when we think about people and where we are in our modern workplace today, things have changed a lot over the last few years, especially with the pandemic, many people going remote, virtual, uh, changing the way we work. How does that uh, play into and, and why is that something that we need to be paying attention to? Yeah, so I, I think humanistic leadership is actually becoming more and more important um, as a framework. So especially when we think about the world of work changing, there is a push towards commodification. There's also a push towards thinking of people, you know, as we learn more about people and how to manage them, like tweaking things. So like I can get, if I pull this lever, like, you know, almost like people as robots, like if I pull this lever, I can get this. If I gamify my system, I can get that much more productivity. And I think that push in that direction makes a lot of sense and it has some short-term benefits in many ways, but the long-term costs are there and they're real. The other thing I'll, I'll say is that I think we have a new generation of people coming into the workforce. And I actually think this is a generation, I teach um, at USC folks from across, from execs to freshmen. I actually, actually mm. teach a, a general education seminar to USC freshmen. They're not even business school students. Um, and so I really see just people at different stages. And so it's fascinating often talking about even similar content with my freshmen, my undergrad seniors, my MBA students and then execs. Um, and I really see this, this difference. I actually have learned so much from the, the new students coming in. I think that they're thinking about the world of work and, and their own careers in a really different way. Many of them are very mature in terms of thinking about like, how do they want to interact with work? What is sort of like, they're thinking of like this arc of their lives um, and, the, and, what, and what their relationship with work will be over the arc of their lives at a very young age. Um, and so I think that it's almost like we're going to have to we're gonna to have to interface with this generation in a way that, that starts where they're starting from. And I actually think there's a lot we can learn from them. So it's exciting to say, you know, if we take that lens, what type of leadership would we be creating? And, and then it goes back and, and creates an environment where, where people coming in with that perspective are gonna be that much more successful. Yeah, I agree completely. And that's something that I'm constantly fascinated by studying uh, generational leadership and, you know, how things are changing. We can always learn from, younger people coming into the workplace, into the world. Uh, but we are truly facing a generational shift right now, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, I think those freshmen that you're teaching in college are the beginning of Gen Z, right? Yep. Starting to enter college and the workplace, you know, kind of right on that precipice, you know, born around the year 2000, something like that, uh, which is like when we all started getting cell phones and getting on the internet and things, and they were born into that world. Um, when we think about from a leader and organizational perspective, I'm curious, uh, starting to work with some of those Gen Z uh, young adults, what are some things that they're looking for and really uh, paying attention to and that are important to them that we need to be paying attention to in the working world? Yeah, so, so the first thing I want to say is, you know, I think a lot of times we, we look at this as a problem. Like our mindset is like, how can we manage them? Oh, these young mm. kids coming in, you know, like what could we do to get the most out of them? And oh, they're making us change and they want, you know, right. days off and they want flex time, right. and they want, you know, free food, you know, like, and, and it's sort of this like, I, I think that's the wrong mindset to take. I think it is, I think there's something to say what are ways that they might be seeing things and challenging some of the ways we've been doing things or some of the, some of the implicit assumptions that we have and saying, what can we learn? Maybe what can we learn from them? Like, what are they saying they want and why do they want it? Um, so, so like I said, I think one of the biggest things to, for me is that they think about they're, they're very thoughtful. I find many of the students that 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 I speak to, um, they're really thinking. So they they have they have different the, the sort of metrics of success that a lot of us us have 
had our whole careers, they don't necessarily have those metrics of success. Um, they think, some of them think in terms of sprints, not only in terms of at work, but in terms of like the arc of their career. So they want to work hard and play hard. It's something that I hear from a lot of them. I'm willing to work really hard, but I don't want to only work really hard. Mm. I want to be able to work really hard, then break, then work really hard, then break. Um, probably and know, they probably want to know why they're working so hard as well, right? Like what's the reason or purpose behind all of this? Where are we going? Yeah, yeah. like why am I doing this? Am I doing something that's meaningful? Um, is it meaningful to me? Is it meaningful in the larger space of the world? They're asking some of those really big questions, um, I think. And I, again, I think it's easy to roll our eyes at some of what we see. And that's sort of traditionally what older people do um, when they look at the young people today, you know, but I, I, think, I think there's something very real about it. And I think they're asking some challenging questions. Um, I know I talk a little bit uh, in, in some of my classes about the fire idea of, you know, this notion that you can work really, really hard and retire early. Um, and I think that some of them are, are some of them are really thinking about it. Like they're really thinking of that broader set of questions of like, how do I want, in addition to being engaged environmentally and socially and thinking about those issues, you know, as well as they, as they try to decide how they want to live their lives. They're not just doing what other people want them to do. They're, they're really trying to craft lives that have maybe this deeper sense of meaning. Um, so it's a really different, it's a really, it's a global, diverse, they're seeing a lot, they're used to seeing a lot. Um, so they're not just comparing, you know, they didn't just grow up in this tiny vacuum. They're, they're sort of used to, ex, you know, ex broader exposure mm -hmm. um, and they're using it to ask, I think, important questions. So I think there's a lot of promise here. I hope we don't squander the promise. Um, I, I, I really think that they're, no, they're forcing us to ask some questions. Yeah, I agree. I think that there is tons of promise. And I think that I love that I hear so much about the younger generation Gen Z asking lots of questions and, and really starting to impact our working cultures in different companies, really asking a lot about inclusivity, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, becoming more and more important uh, across the working world in lots of companies. And a lot of that's being driven by younger generations asking a lot of questions, things we need to pay attention to. Related to that, I know you have a background in psychology, uh, yeah. Where do you see, and you teach in a business school, where do you see like the main intersections now between psychology and business and how does that help you and potentially help others who are thinking about becoming, you know, better leaders and better business people? Yeah, I think it has a tremendous number of, of overlap. And I think people have recognized that. People are often surprised. They're like, wait, you're a psychologist. Why do you teach in a business school? And I always say, you know, fundamentally, I'm in a management department. So many questions of management are really questions of psychology. And I think that there's been really an explosion of interest in this overlap, um, both in terms of thinking of the, the whole person and understanding, like, if I want to manage people, don't I have to understand them first? Like, don't I have to understand how they think? Don't I understand, have to understand their emotional reactions? Um, the same thing on the customer side, there's been an explosion of an appreciation of, you know, if I want to sell to people, then I have to understand how, what are these people's you know, what is the problem they're grappling with? What do they care about? How are they understanding what I'm doing? At the same time, I'll say there's also this flip side. Um, I teach courses on behavioral economics and decision making, uh, where we spend a lot of time talking about cognitive biases and trying to help uh, people understand some of the systematic ways that people make mistakes. And I used to say, you know, many, you know, when I started teaching the, this these types of courses a number of years ago, um, I said, you know, laying out like, why are we doing this? I would say to students, you know, I'm trying to help you understand your own tendencies to make better choices. But I'm also trying to help you understand other people because it gives you tremendous and tremendous um, potential in terms of influence. And I used to sort of jokingly say, very, the very first day of class, you know, and you can use that for, for good or for bad, you know, like for, you, uh, that's up to you how you choose that. And I would sort of jokingly say that. What I tell students now is I'm not joking about it anymore. I don't think it's at all remotely funny because one of the things we've also seen as there's been this recognition of, hey, if I understood people better, I could influence them more effectively, is we've seen these amazing findings that have been built up over the years from psychology, from economics, from this merger of the two behavioral economics. And we've seen how companies have used those, not necessarily for the better of mankind. And a lot of that, a lot of that works, you know, started out with a lot of promise, so like we're gonna help people make better choices, but you know, in the wrong hands, there's lots of, that's that tinkering. And that's that I can, I you know if I nudge people in this way, I'll get them to spend one more minute on my app or I'll spend them to have that much more engagement. And so now I'm actually much, much more serious. And when I teach semester long classes, I just spend a a lot more time talking about the ethics of this because I think I want I want students to grapple with like yeah like we, we do have these tools we do know a lot about how to get people to you know spend one more minute but like is that what we want to be doing 
um, is that right? Is that wrong? Um, and so I, we spend, I think, a, a quite a bit more time grappling with some of those issues than I ever used to in the past, not only because students care about them, which I think they do, um, but I think it's 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 become something that sort of the 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 promise has been taken. The promise of the intersection of psychology and business has also been taken in ways that have not necessarily added to the betterment of of the larger good. Yeah, and you think about management leadership. A lot of it involves uh, influence, and of course, that relates to psychology and human behavior and understanding people and what they want and how can you motivate them to do the things you want to do. And hopefully, you're doing that for good for the right reasons, right? But obviously. People can take that in the wrong direction. And if you work in marketing, I mean, it's all about human behavior and how can you motivate, inspire, uh, you know, get people to buy your product or sign up for something, whatever it may be. And of course, we see we won't go down the rabbit hole of social media, right? But all these, we have companies that are spending all their time trying to understand human behavior and, and influence people to act in certain ways, spend longer on the app, that sort of thing. This is fascinating. Like, who employs people? My background is social psychology. Who mm. hires social psychologists? So, social psychology is an academic discipline, right? So, right. people go to get their PhDs. They are usually funded programs, often funded partially either by the government or the university. Traditionally, people became academics, but there's not enough jobs for academics. So, who has become really the number one uh, employer? large technology companies. Do you know how many how many academic PhDs work at Facebook? It's actually fascinating. Go on to their go on to their research experience. You know, they have all these different researchers that work there. It's like it's like a university. There are so 80, 100, I forget the current number. There is so are there are so many um, people who work not just for Facebook, for all of the companies. Mm -hmm. um, and again a lot of it, there's always this balance of like it's not you could let's take something as simple as, as free food, right? Like all of the perks, which is a, a very humane and um, in many ways, people-centered way of interacting with your employees. It says like, let's let's get them to do their laundry. Let's get them to have on-site medical care. Let's, it's fantastic. But at a larger, at, you know, at a larger, well, what's your goal? Like, are you trying to help them? You know, is this intrinsic? Is this about, you know, we don't want them to leave the campus. So we're going to give them as long as possible, right? Exactly. Do your laundry here by all means, you know. So it's it's tricky. I like, think asking some of those larger and I think people are asking some of those larger questions, but but oftentimes it's not one motive. I think oftentimes we, we do really care about our employees. We want them to, you know, be successful I and mean, we care about that intrinsically. Um, but at the same time, there's you know also this other side of yeah, and then we can get more more out of them if if they're if they're flourishing, we can get more. So it's it's tricky. Uh, interesting, you know, given this topic of social science and psychology, uh, I know you've done a lot of research on communication and on visual language as well. Uh, how does meeting virtually, because, you know, a lot of people before the pandemic were going to an office every day, meeting with people in person, uh, and now we live in this more remote virtual world, where it seems like not many people going, especially with those big tech companies going back to the office anytime soon, uh, how does meaning virtually impact the, the power of messages and our ability to influence and inspire uh, people that we're working with? Yeah, I, I think um, I think virtual work, there's tons of positives to virtual work, like any new, and this is such a dramatic change. Um, you know, I think, I think no one could have imagined that we would all be able to just leap onto a platform like Zoom and have these conversations right away. That was something that was unimaginable um, before, before COVID-19 sort of forced the question. There's tremendous positives to this. There are also real negatives. And I think it's hard because often the negatives um, are longer term issues. So for example, you know, if you're established, you know what you're doing, um, there's lots of reasons that it works great to work uh, remotely. Uh, you can get what you need. You can be very focused. Um, you get into a meeting, right? You right away get to jump onto a meeting. You know what you're doing. There's less of that chit chat. There's less of that water cooler talk. Is that a waste of time? Well, it depends on your perspective. So for some people, it's fantastic. It's very focused, very, very um, right away. Sort of you're in there, you're fully embraced. At the same time, over time, it's really hard because you really need that person to person connection and you need the serendipity of just the conversation, like those things matter. Like the fact that you're sitting next to someone and you both get up and you bump into each other and you have this conversation. It's much harder to do that in a planned world where every interaction is just is just planned. Um, I think I think today there's a tremendous power of um, virtual connections. I think you know it can feel you can feel you can feel like you're really engaged with someone even though you're meeting with them um, with them virtually. At the same time, I think distance itself, like the experience of being far away from people, is hard. Um, and so I think. 
think some of the tricks that sort of like the natural results of being far away is this shift to, to sort of the broader and the more abstract. Um, but I think we have to be careful of like minding the distance. And I think that there are things we really need to try to do to create proximity across those distances. So to really remind ourselves uh, that this person is, is real, they are there, um, they are engaged with you, you are in this together. And I think that those things become really important as we shift to this more remote dispersed uh, yeah. workforce. And, and when you say distance and, and the way you were looking at it before we went virtual, are you talking about the, the physical space in between us, whether we're sitting 10 feet apart or two feet apart and how that changes our dynamic? And then obviously as we're working virtually, we're, we're kind of close to each other, but also have a perceived distance between us. And I know you know, right now you and I have about 3000 miles physically between us, but we're right here face to face on Zoom. Yeah, so so we actually look at just the knowledge that someone is far away. So actually a lot of the data we've collected, um, again, pre-pandemic, where people were always actually engaging remotely, they were they were actually writing to each other, uh, just knowing that, that, which is sort of fascinating, just knowing that the person is far away hmm. um, changes that tendency of how do you engage with them. Um, just that knowledge that you're 3,000 miles away. Now it's different if you're like here with me, you're, 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 you're this is an interesting experience, right? You're 3,000 miles away, but you're also here with me right now right. in what is my guest room turned office, right? Like, yeah. So behind the fake background, right? So no, I'm not actually standing here. So there's this, there's this sense of which there's lots of distances that are sort of mixing, right? I'm in a virtual space with you right here with me. At the same time, you, I actually know that you are quite, quite far away from me. But I remember we, we, we ran a study a bunch of years ago where we asked people uh, to communicate. They had to introduce themselves online to someone who uh, we told them either lived uh, in, you know, a few, few miles from them or 3,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's unbelievable to see the difference just colloquially without sort of uh, quantifying that. You know, when it's someone's like three miles away, you're like, hi, how are you? <laughs> like, it's a different mentality. And then like, with this with this someone far away you're like hello my name is it's like a totally different thing like the vibe like it was hard to quantify that vibe but the vibe was like just so totally different and even just that the knowledge of where they are is this trigger of, of how you interact with them mm, so interesting i i want to talk more about that but i also want to make sure we get to some other important topics regards to humanistic leadership and, you know, the modern workplace that we're in. I know you've done a lot of uh, research and look at creativity uh, in the workplace, the modern workplace as well. And I'm wondering, you know, what role does creativity play and, and how is, why is that something we should be thinking about? Yeah, so so I have I've, I've been doing a lot of teaching in the area of creativity, and it's very much connected, I think, to this this question of humanistic leadership and the knowledge of the of the world of work changing so much. You know, when we look at the landscape and we think about, you know, what jobs are going to be here in 20, 30, 40 years from now, if you are doing something that is repetitive, if you are doing something um, where you're doing the same thing, that is something that can be automated. That is a job that is not likely to be around uh, for a while. And I, and I tell this to my MBA students, we introduced um, a new course as part of our core. So as part of the required MBA program, we introduced a novel course a few years ago that my colleague, Bailin Yin, who's now at Amazon, um, and I co-designed together. And it's a course, it's called, it has a fancy uh, sort of ridiculous name. It's called Structured Analysis for Unstructured Problems. Uh, and our, our, our point in the class, it's actually a class that's a mix of critical thinking and creative problem solving. Because, you know, what I, what I try to tell students, you know, that first day is, this is why, this is what's going to differentiate you. This is why you're being hired, right? Like it's hard because the tendency when you're getting your MBA is to focus on all of those, you know, the, the skills, the technical skills. And that might be important in getting that first job. But if you're going to be successful as you go up the ranks, you're going to need to be able to bring creativity. And a lot of our students are very uncomfortable with creativity, very uncomfortable with thinking out of the box. They want it, even, even in teaching creativity, it's like they want flow charts of like, tell me exactly what when I should use each technique that you're teaching yeah. me, you know, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, it's really hard. You know, again, it's sort of like generationally also, it's sort of like, I know how to be successful if it's been planned out for me, but that's not the world we live in. Like we live in a world of ambiguity. And again, as we, as we look to the future of work and we think about what's going to be long lasting, I think your ability to make connections, to combine things in novel ways, to 
see the big picture, to see how something from a totally different field can come in and bring new insight, those things are going to be so important. Um, and I think they're really going to, they, they are what, I'm convinced they are what's going to distinguish you um, in, out there as you, as you engage in your sort of career over the long span. Yeah, I mean, speaking of humanistic leadership, I'm also fascinated by the future of work and how things are changing and AI taking over a lot of jobs. And I think that the more human things that we do, those are the ones that we're going to be able to hold on to, right? Versus the repetitive tasks, as you mentioned, and getting creative is something that's very human. And I think all of us can do, even those of us who think that we're not that creative. Uh, turns out we can be. It's a, I feel like it's a muscle like anything else. Um, related to that, I know you teach and use a lot of design thinking, which has become really popular in a lot of tech companies like Google and others uh, and, and some universities. Uh, but it's something that every company and team can use. I wonder if you could talk more about the, the power and importance of design thinking. Yeah, so, so design thinking is, is very much in this humanistic space, right? Design thinking is all about putting the user at the center of the problem solving process. It's all about thinking about what is the user experiencing? What does the user care about? It's not that I, it's not that I love the user define everything, right? My job in design thinking is to help identify what it is that the user needs and then design for the user um, and the user's problem that I've helped to identify. And people don't always know what they need, right? So it's about really having empathy and really developing a deep, deep understanding, not a surface level understanding, and then making that central to the entire problem solving process. Process. I completely agree with you. I always tell students when I teach design thinking that, you know, you could take this on different levels. Like you could, you could fully buy in to design thinking. You could say like, I'm going to become like, it's all going to be about design thinking. A lot of technology companies, a lot of consultancies have done that. Or you could actually say like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to become a design thinker. This is the solution to everything, but I'm going to use the principles and the ideas of design thinking, starting with empathy, which is a really, I'm going to really put that at the center of my problems solving process in a very individualized way. So like I think about, you know, the, the, the art of practical management, the art of getting the most out of your employees, you as an individual can adopt a design thinking perspective on that, that can be extremely powerful to really say, how can I design the, the Monday meetings that I have in a better way from this sort of broad design thinking perspective. So I think that, you know, design thinking has had a huge influence um, on in many areas, but I think there's also a tendency to say, oh, it's for those people. Uh, I think it's it's one of these, it's a broad set of, it's a broad lens that allows you to, to think about the, the problem solving process from this user centric way. Um, design thinking is also totally a theoretical. Anything that helps you do any of these steps of design thinking, anything you know, that helps you empathize better, and there's lots out there that can, is part of design thinking, right? So there's a sort of wealth of ideas and knowledge around design thinking that, again, you as an individual person in any organization, as a manager, uh, especially, I think, you really can bring in some of those ideas into your daily work. work. Fascinating. Uh, I would love to dive more into that at some point. Um, but we've got to start to wrap things up here. So I have two more questions for you, and you can choose to answer them more broadly or concretely. Uh, it's up to you. One is, you know, this is the lifelong learning education series. And I know Marshall has this theme around lifelong learning that it's not just about getting a college degree or an MBA and then spending the rest of your career doing that, that we want people to really be thinking about investing in lifelong learning to continue to be relevant in the working world. So for you, why is lifelong learning so important for leaders today? So, so I want to go back to the creativity piece. I think one of the most important things of lifelong learning is that you're feeding your brain. You're getting exposures, deep exposures to different ideas. And you don't necessarily know right away how that's going to have an impact. But you are, by feeding your brain in this way, you are setting the stage for doing something more novel, more innovative down the road. I'm, I'm a big fan. I make every, every class of mine read this very long meandering speech given many years ago at USC uh, by Charlie Munger. It's a very, very famous, well-known speech where he talks about this idea of mental models. It was, I think, given in 1994. So it goes back a while. And Charlie um, Munger, of course, famously Warren, Warren Buffett's partner in- Exactly, uh, in exactly. And a big fan of studying cognitive bias. Um, but this idea and this idea of his of mental mo models has spawned podcasts, it has spawned books, like there are whole books you can buy that are based on this notion of mental models. I always tell students for me, like, I really, I really 
I buy into this idea because I think it's a framework for learning. What he's talking about is like, if you have these models or these frameworks in your head, you carry around this wealth of potential. And then when you go out into the world and you do your thing, you can, you can see, you can say, oh, that's, oh, that's this thing. That's, that's this idea. Ooh, no one else is realizing that's this idea. Ooh, and in his case, I could make a lot of money now that I've realized that's this idea. And I think that that really sets the stage for like part of the broader goals of being a lifelong learner of really saying like, yes, I'm doing, I may be, fun, I may be functioning right now and doing what I'm doing, but if I want that potential, if I want to, you know, be able to make some of those connections and I bring in different ideas from different places and I, and I commit to really learning what that can do over time is I think really, really powerful um, because it's feeding, it's, it's, it's creating you know, the stuff from which you're going to draw, you know, people always talk about the power of analogies, but like, how do you create analogies? You have to know something to create analogies. You have to have knowledge of things from different areas to be able to go back and say, oh, this is like this. Um, and so I think that engagement, that sort of commitment to always learn, um, I think is, is tremendously, tremendously important, especially given the changing nature of work. I agree completely. All right, last question for you, Cheryl. Uh, we talked about the importance of lifelong learning for people that are aware of that and interested in investing in lifelong learning. You know, there's a lot of options out there. Why should people be considering Marshall executive education? What, what sets uh, Marshall exec ed uh, apart from other options? So I think at Marshall, we really, we really believe in the lifelong learning model. We really believe in the student journey. We really believe in students not just coming and having an experience where they're, they're having fun while they're there, they're engaged while they're there, but really thinking about it having an impact. I also think because we're grounded in the university setting, we really think about empirics. So especially in the topic of humanistic leadership, right? Like we really, it, it's about, it's, but we're not, we're, not, we're, not, we're not relying on anecdote. Like we're really trying to say there's, there's, there's science out there, there's knowledge out there, there's experience out there that at a broad level we can bring together. And yes, we're gonna use it to apply to very practical problems. We're gonna try to you know, help deal with the questions that people are, are dealing with and struggling this, but we're going to do this in this broad lens that ultimately is, is based in a deep understanding of how people think, of how people manage, and, 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 and to think about how that happens across uh, individuals and across people so that we're not just relying on stories. And I, I think that that's something that I think is really important. That coupled with this real respect for the student, for the learner, a deep respect for the time people are taking to uh, make time in their very busy lives for learning, and a deep commitment to honoring that, that, uh, that commitment that they're showing by giving them a product that they can really walk out with um, and use uh, in, in very much their, their daily life afterwards. Absolutely. Well, as you said, we know time is valuable for lots of people who want to make sure that it's worth their time. And uh, this was definitely worth mine. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom with us today. And I look forward to speaking with you more in the future. Thanks, Andy. It's been, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for, for spending this time with me this morning. And I look forward to future conversations.